Okay, fellow babies, welcome back to Pactor Factor on Sifted.net and to our Patreon patrons, thank you for your support. To our intelligent viewers on YouTube who have figured out how to link their Twitch accounts to their Prime accounts, thank you. Please remember to click below. We show you how to do it and renew this every month. Shane gets 250 from Amazon. Let it happen. He needs the money. Thank you. If you're watching on YouTube and you're too lame to do any of that stuff, please follow me at Michael Packer on Twitter. Please follow Shane at Dinfire. Follow at Sifted Games. If you're watching this, the least you can do is follow us and tell two friends. Thanks for joining us um, this week. Our first question comes from Patreon from Gregor Gulwee. Um, Activision is working on a separate version, mobile version of Call of Duty in contrast to Fortnite which is truly cross-platform. What are the pluses and minuses of each approach? Well, you know, Fortnite's pretty impressive because Fortnite used, Fortnite on mobile was intended just to show off, you know, to brag about the power of the Unreal Engine and how you could do cross-platform play with the Unreal Engine. And cross-platform meaning that the game you see on your mobile screen is the same as the game the guy sees on his PC or his console, that technology is unbelievable. I mean, it's synchronous gameplay on mobile is really hard. So um, let me just throw out from a finance guy to the tech guys, props to the Unreal team. Now, I understand Unity will do that as well. Um, I don't think Activision knows how to do this. So Activision isn't good at mobile. They've never been in mobile. Um, King is in mobile, but King doesn't do cross-platform. Um, it's, it's just amazing if you log on with your mobile phone, if it actually remembers what level of Candy Crush you're on. And to be fair, like on my mobile phone, it doesn't carry over the shit that I own in Candy Crush. So if you get like free items, you get lollipop hammers every day on mobile, and then you go play it on desktop, they're not there. Um, so they track all of your items without giving you credit cross-platform, they are not capable yet of doing cross-platform play. So the answer uh, to your question, the simple answer is there's no chance Call of Duty Mobile is cross-platform. Not gonna happen. Not until Activision figures it out. I don't think they use either Unity or Unreal. So I don't think that they are gonna build these in engines that are designed for cross-platform. So no, it's not gonna happen. Pluses and minuses. Um, I'm not really sure why uh, Epic did this other than to prove out that they could. I think they wanted to show that, not the cross-platform nature, but they wanted to show that they could provide fully synchronous gameplay, meaning everybody playing the game, every person they're seeing is a real person being controlled by another person. So just if everybody on mobile Fortnite could play against everybody else on mobile Fortnite and the hundred characters all could see one another you know, that's a, an accomplishment. That's hard to do. Um, I know there are other mobile games who have done it, but this is really impressive. Um, I don't think Call of Duty has any interest in doing that, and I don't know if they'll get synchronous gameplay or not. I'm curious to see how their mobile game works. Chinese mobile games tend to work that way. So my guess is Call of Duty will work that way, but my guess also is it's gonna be wonky and buggy and not work very well. So pluses and minuses, um, use the Unreal Engine because it works doesn't cost very much to license. Minus is build your own engine and be pig-headed about it and think everything you do is better than everybody else. That's the Activision approach. Probably not the smartest thing in the world. Um, to give you an analogy, Netflix a few years ago, like five, said they were gonna build their own content delivery network, which is beyond what you need to understand, but their own ability to build a cloud infrastructure and deliver streaming video to everybody's homes and devices and Amazon had the best in class cloud you know, content de delivery network. And Netflix said they're gonna build their own, they're gonna spend a billion dollars. They never did. They just quietly abandoned that idea and used Amazon because it works and it's cheap for the user because Amazon's building it for all users. So think of Unity and Unreal that way. Um, Epic has proved it works. They have already made the investment they will license that for not very much money to any publisher who wants to use it. And that's why they proved the concept. Um, it's dumb to build your own. And I think Call of Duty is gonna build their own, regret it and switch over to Unity or uh, Unreal one of these days. Our next question from Patreon from Tom Duvac. Does voting with your wallet always work in changing how companies behave? 
With games as a service becoming a leading revenue model, does it shield companies from financial consequences due to controversy? Okay, two different questions. Um, no, voting with your wallet doesn't always work. In fact, it almost never works. Um, it does work if your stock goes straight down. So, you know, share price, this is kind of obvious, is a function of supply and demand. The supply of stock is the same. So if demand drops, the price drops. So if there are more, you know, this is a joke, but if there are more sellers than buyers, the stock goes down. If there's more buyers than sellers, the stock goes up, period, because there's a constant number of shares. And so if a company stock goes down to the point where they realize they have a serious problem, then the company typically will respond. And remember, stocks go down for a bunch of reasons. I mean, if, if a stock is on its way to bankruptcy, like Midway was, THQ, a claim, then the, the managements, there's nothing they can do. They're doing the best they can to turn it around and they fail and the stock goes down to zero. If a stock goes down that's not in danger of bankruptcy, like Snapchat or like GoPro or like Fitbit, um, Snap was 26, it's now under six. Or it might be over six, but it's $6. Um, Fitbit was in the 20s, is, is under five. Um, GoPro was in the 80s, it's at about six. Um, and none of them are not even close to bankruptcy. So shareholders voted with their wallet. Did managements change much? I have to be honest, GoPro not much. Um, GoPro said, well, okay, the Hero 5 didn't save us. So the Hero 7 will. I mean, it's the same old thing. Fitbit, yeah, management said, okay, we're not gonna win the battle of trying to sell smartwatches and activity trackers. We're gonna win by getting healthcare companies to embrace our products, integrate it in, so that if you wear a Fitbit tracker, you get a break on your medical expenses or your life or your health insurance. We'll see, it's a brand new thing, so we'll see if it works. Um, so the answer to your question on does it always work? No, it hasn't worked with GoPro. Maybe it's worked with Fitbit. Yes, I think it works with Snap. Um, with games as a service becoming a leading revenue model to shield companies from financial consequences due to controversy. Well, what it does is it makes their revenues more predictable. So if you have recurring revenues, revenues instead of having to worry about whether this year's Battlefield is good or bad, if it sells 20 million or 10, which is a giant swing in revenue and profits. If you could have a Battlefield subscription and you could have, you know, 5 million people paying you $10 a month, you kind of make it smooth and make 600 million a year instead of worrying about a billion every other year. And if it drops to 500 million, you're screwed. So that's the, the place they're going. I don't think Battlefield as a brand is good enough to pull that off but maybe all of EA games, which is what EA Origin Access is. So, you know, I don't think you're gonna get companies just saying, okay, here we are, we just launched our new subscription service and we're now a SaaS model, that's subscription as a service, software as a service. Um, I think instead it'll, it'll be gradual, it'll migrate, there'll be more and more offered. And the real question is, is the subscription offered by Microsoft with Project X Cloud? or is the service offered directly by EA with EA Origin Access? I kind of think subscription is gonna come after a la carte. So I think Amazon is gonna build both. It's gonna be iTunes first, buy games on, on Amazon, and if enough people buy games on Amazon, then they'll offer a subscription, just like iTunes came before Apple Music. So I don't think software as a service is gonna happen soon in terms of thrive. It's gonna be available, but it's not gonna thrive. And I think that um, over time, that's the model the publishers want. I think the ultimate model is gonna be single player games for 60 bucks, ongoing multiplayer supported by microtransactions that might be free, including Battle Royale mode, and then a whole bunch of free to play stuff like Hearthstone and Heroes of the Storm and Overwatch and PUBG, which is not free yet, and Fortnite. So I think you're gonna get a blend of all those things in mobile, um, and then the publishers will just make money every place they can. Our next question from Sifted from Best Jeppy. In the last decade or so, we've seen the big third-party publishers pivot from having several studios making medium-sized games and medium-sized profits to a situation where they have fewer studios, produce fewer games that make them bigger. Do you think this model is sustainable in the long run since every single game must be a hit? 
what happens when one of those big games flop. Um, it's exactly the same thing you've seen in the movie industry. So it used to be that we had 100, I'm sorry, 220 theatrical releases from the big seven movie studios. We're down to 130 or so. And with Disney and Fox merging, we're gonna be at 120 or so. So a massive reduction. Uh, I read an interesting interview with Rob Lowe. Uh, he made a TV show called The Grinder that I thought was really cute, but it got canceled after one season. And they asked Rob Lowe, why don't you make romantic comedies anymore? Why are you doing only you know, the West Wing and Community or Parks and Rec, whatever it is, and this? And he goes, because they don't make those movies anymore. You know, I used to make these small budget, $30 million budget films, and the studios just don't make them anymore, so there's no demand for me, so I had to go into TV. That's what happened. So these small budget movies aren't made anymore, small budget games aren't made anymore. It doesn't make sense to make a game and hope to sell one or two million units and make a small profit. It's better to spend a lot more money and hope to sell 10 million units and make a giant profit. And what ends up happening is, you're right, if you make a 10 million unit plan seller and you sell two, you're screwed. But that's why you get so many sequels. That's why franchises matter. Um, and so the question is, you know, which makes more money? Call of Duty or, you know, a one-off game like, like uh, Anthem? Well, EA's trying to make Anthem into a franchise. And they hope that Anthem comes out every three or four years. Um, but Call of Duty coming out every single year, it's kind of a lock. It's going to sell 20 million units and do a billion dollars in revenue. Um, so Activision has the recurring revenue model and that, you know, again, they oversaturate it with Guitar Hero, they oversaturate it with Skylanders. Um, they obviously have their one-off hits like Diablo and Starcraft that come out every 12 years, but I think they'd all rather do annual franchises. I'm going to predict that EA is going to make Battlefield annual, that Respawn is going to work on a Battlefield game, um, that DICE will keep making Battlefield. I wonder what happens to Glenn Schofield and Mike Condry at Sledgehammer, who got pushed aside, you know, they're doing strategy and stuff. Why, they're in the Bay Area, why don't they just start a new studio and make, um, make a new Battlefield game and be the third studio at EA? Uh, you heard it here first. I haven't talked to them. I have no idea if they're doing that. But I think that the big bet model has worked for movies and the problem is if people aren't buying those small games, why make them? So um, yes, I think that it is sustainable in the long run. I think you're right, if one of them's a flop, some executives get fired. Uh, Infinity Ward made two bad Call of Duty games and Eric Hirschberg no longer is the president of Activision Publishing. I'm sure he left to pursue other opportunities, but he's not there anymore. And the head of Infinity Ward has been fired a couple of times. And, I hope they're getting it right because they're good guys. But uh, when they fought, people lose their jobs. And when they work, people don't. Our last question this week from YouTube from Lord Immort Immortalix. Will there ever be a market for adults only games on consoles? Not in the West. Um, yes, there'll be a market in Asia. The Japanese seem to like them. Um, Adult only experiences, yes, virtual reality for sure, but not games and not made by the people you suspect will make the games. So sure, um, it's kind of shocking to me whenever I see porn statistics, how many people actually view porn and it's like everybody, it's shocking to me. Um, I just read a book called Everybody Lies. I, I highly recommend that book if you want a fascinating nonfiction book about Google search and exactly what people do but the numbers for porn are shocking. How do I kill my husband? Shocking. It's like, it's crazy, it's really a great book. It's, it's crazy what people look at, but apparently everybody likes porn. The question is, you know, is the right, um, is the right outfit to deliver porn to you a game publisher or a porn company? I mean, the answer is it's a porn company. So the porn makers know how to do this. And, you know, honestly, you might get, game development talent working in the porn industry to, de to deliver adults only content to you, but it's not gonna be the creators that make the games you love. It's not gonna be Bethesda. It's not gonna be Respawn. It's not gonna be Insomniac. It's gonna be, you know, I don't even know what they call those places, but you know, the porn studios in Chatsworth are gonna hire developers. So yes, this is gonna happen. I think it's gonna be a virtual reality solution before it's a uh, game solution. And, and maybe augmented reality, but 
The answer is no, I don't think so. That's it, fellow babies. Thanks for joining us on Patreon. We appreciate our patrons. On YouTube, we appreciate anybody who's smart enough to link Twitch and Amazon Prime. And if you're not, please follow me at Michael Pactor, Shane at Dinfire, and Sifted Games at Sifted Games. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on scotch other than to say, because I promised I would do scotch lessons, other than to say, um, when you get your Glenlivet, start with your Dewars, then your Glenlivets, then your Aberlores, then you're, then you're trying your 18-year-olds, and, you, and you've done all, I'm sorry, then all the flavored ones, Glenmorangie flavored, then you moved up to your 18-year-olds. This is when you're ready to start experimenting. So that's when you start having fun with whiskey. And as I said, 18-year-old scotches are unbelievable. Uh, something about aging in a barrel, 21-year-olds are even better, 25-year-olds are even better. So that gets expensive, okay? And I will tell you right now, there are no bad 30-year-old scotches. They don't exist. Um, I have had a 30-year-old and a 29-year-old in the last year. The 30-year-old was a Highland Park. It's $1,000 a bottle given to me as a gift. The 29-year-old I had was called We Miss, W-E-M-Y-S-S. -S. Look it up online. It's got a pink label. I drank a bottle last night, so this is the time when we did this, while the Dodgers were playing for 18 <laughs> innings. And I had a buddy over, uh, two buddies, and we finished a bottle. Uh, 200 bucks. And it's worth it. It's worth really trying something that aged. Go to klwines.com and look at their old scotches. I, I also buy from Remedy, R-E-M-E-D-Y, liquors in Glendale online. Kind of a tough surf, search function. They have phenomenal old whiskeys. And again, don't do this till you've been trying scotches for more than a year. Save up your money. It'll make a nice Christmas present to yourself next Christmas. Buy yourself a $200 or more expensive bottle of scotch and try it. And do your research because this is wasted money if you don't like it. But oh my God, once you get into these, they're so fun.